Hi everyone, this is Christina Howard speaking, and this is a screen capture of the first uh, lecture PowerPoint for Biology 160 at Clark College. Um, this particular screencast is aimed at my students in particular, but uh, can be used to study by other Biology 160 students at Clark if they want to. Um, if you aren't my student, just be aware that some of the nuts and bolts portions of the course, like any reminders or points values, uh, etc., may be different than your course. So go consult your instructor for that. All right, so let's get right to it because we've got a lot to cover in this first lecture. So Biology 160 is general biology, and it's easy to fall into the trap of seeing the one at the front of 160 and thinking, oh, this course is going to be a piece of cake. It's easy. It's only 100 level. Please note, though, that there is a 60 after the one. So I'm going to grab my pen here and circle that. So biology 160 is intended for healthcare and or biological or natural science majors. So it's actually going to be more rigorous and more challenging than biology 100. And that's because we need you to hang on to the skills you learn in biology 160 so that you can transfer those skills to higher division biology courses and eventually to your career. So we hold you to a really high standard in this course because we need to prepare you for what's next for you. So this can be used for an associate's transfer degree, um, and it's more rigorous than other options, as I mentioned. So the goals of the course uh, as you make your way through this term are twofold. First, we want you to have a foundational knowledge of basic biological systems, and this is going to be really important uh, as you continue to advance in your careers. So, for example, if you're going to be with me next term in anatomy and physiology, I will expect that you have hung on to the basic principles of biology so that you can then apply them to the anatomy and physiology of humans. Uh, and also, we're going to try and work on refining and improving some study skills. So the reason for this is that a lot of students come into college or restart college uh, thinking that they've got their study skills on lock. So students like to do things like read and aggressively highlight the textbook. That doesn't really do much for retention. Um, Flashcards are great, but only if they're not too information dense. Uh, going over the PowerPoints and not reading the book is not really rich, deep studying either. So one thing that we find is really helpful and uh, imparts student success is if we as a group look at what y'all are doing to study and then identify areas where you could maybe tweak a few things to maximize your time. So study smarter, not necessarily study harder. All right, so some nuts and bolts stuff, and this is one of the things that's going to be the same across courses, so uh, it's not the case that different Biology 160 instructors use different textbooks. We've all agreed to adopt one textbook, and it's this one, Concepts of Biology. So this is available online, and as long as you download a PDF of it or view it online, it is free, which is great. So uh, OpenStax which is the organization that produces this text, uh, is a purveyor of free and open source and open access textbooks. So the one we're using is Concepts of Biology. Um, make sure that it includes the word concepts when you go look at their website to access the book because there are other biology texts for various different purposes available on OpenStax, but Concepts of Biology is the one that we are going to be using, so just bear that in mind. Another great thing about OpenStax is that because all the books are free, let's say you're not loving the explanation of chemical bonding in this book, for example, so that's something we'll do. You can go to OpenStax and look at other books. So let's say you're not really getting covalent bonding very well and you want to read a book that phrases or parses that information differently, you can go to OpenStax and look at their chemistry selection. Maybe something in there will appeal to your learning style a little bit better than the way we're explaining it here. So that's another advantage. And there's lots and lots of really good free books on there. So I would encourage you to go peruse and check it out in addition to getting your textbook. Um, apropos of the textbook discussion, um, it's free if you download a PDF of it or if you look at it online. There is an option to have it printed, um, and that does cost money because textbooks are printed on dead trees and those cost money. But 
it's way less expensive than traditional textbooks through a company like McGraw-Hill or Pearson, for example. So um, you're basically paying for the cost of producing the book rather than for all the bells and whistles of a fancy pants traditional textbook. All right. Another thing you're going to need is access to Canvas. So many of you are arriving at Biology 160 having already been in Canvas, and that's great. So I've set up all your Canvas shells um, so that you'll be able to interact with the modules we have on there right away. But just in case for any newbies out there, uh, Canvas is our learning management system or LMS at Clark. So another example of an LMS is Blackboard or Desire to Learn, D2L, uh, Moodle was another one. So basically they're an internet-based interface where you and your instructor and your classmates come together in a digital commons and exchange information and materials related to the class. So when you register at Clark, uh, your Canvas username and password are automatically generated for you. Uh, if you have been admitted but not yet registered, then you will not be able to log into Canvas. But I assume if you've made it this far, you are registered for at least one or two courses. So uh, you all should be able to do this. So this is what the Canvas start page for Clark looks like. Um, and the link to get to this page is on the student homepage at Clark. So if you have not logged in before, here's how that works. Your full nine digit student ID number with no dashes is your username, so that would go here. Oh, I was trying to write ID, but it didn't go very well. There we go. Uh, and then your password is your global PIN number plus two zeros added to the end. So whatever your global PIN is, add two zeros with no spaces, and that goes in here. So PIN plus zero zero. Okay. So what do you need Canvas for? Well, the syllabus lives on Canvas as well as the class schedule. Uh, all of the lecture slides, so the things that I'm using to make these screencasts are gonna be on there. Uh, labs as well. Any pre-lecture prep assignments that I have you do, there are also practice quizzes to better prepare you for the exams. Uh, any learning worksheets I pass out, um, I put a bunch of supplemental resources and videos up for you to watch to enhance your knowledge. And of course, the grade book is on there as well, so you'll be able to see your grades recorded in there uh, as we make our way through the term. Okay, this is one of those slides that is really designed for my students only. So Christina Howard's 160 students, not Laura Crampton or Rex Williams is, for example. Uh, so all of the course policies are outlined in the syllabus. This is going to be true for any 160 class because, of course, that's what a syllabus is for. Uh, you need to read the syllabus thoroughly. We're not going to waste class time discussing the syllabus um, because it doesn't serve you as a learner. But it is your responsibility to be familiar with the policies in the syllabus. So you need to read that. And then if you have any questions about things, either email me or your instructor or come back and talk to us about them in person during office hours. So the grading scheme is the same across all courses. The exact points numbers may not match identically, but we have all agreed as a group about the relative percentage ranges that each uh, category needs to have. So testing is emphasized in this course and that is because it's a prerequisite. So a prerequisite is a course that you have to take before you take another course. So for example, this course is a prerequisite for biology 241 and two, which is the two term anatomy and physiology class. And we need to make sure that you are ready to graduate to the next level before we let you go. So you need to achieve a passing grade in 160 in order to get access and unlock the next level of achievement, which is a and or cell biology or what have you. So um, that's why we emphasize testing so much. So testing in total, including your three midterms, your two lab exams and your final, yes, that's a lot of testing, accounts for in this class 73% of your grade and your final exam is 20% of your grade. The rest of these points 
That's about 200, well, exactly 200 points worth of what we call soft points. Oopsie. So soft points are points that are group in nature, so you're going to have the assistance of your classmates to use to help you get as many points as possible, um, and or just easier to earn than hardcore testing points. So this represents your cushion in the class. And also in a couple cases, we allow you to drop the lowest of a series of assignments. So you get to drop one of your midterms, you get to drop your lowest lab module, and you get to drop your lowest in class activity. So this is a cushion as well. Um, use these drops wisely. They are not for, I partied too hard and now I'm tired. They are not for, I just don't feel like going to class today. These are to absorb a day when maybe you're having a bad day and you don't do as well as you normally do, or something really bad happens, like you get in a car accident on your way to school and you need to call a tow truck or you're sick. Um, they're for contingencies of life. They're not for leisure time. So just be aware of that. Um, one of the books that is mentioned in your syllabus is this book called The A-Game by Kenneth Sufka. And this basically is a guide. I don't know why it keeps making that weird little line. I haven't worked that out yet. So this is a guide to getting better grades. So I mentioned studying habits uh, earlier in the PowerPoint. And I just want to point out that it's easy to feel defensive about being told that your study habits are poor. It's not a reflection on who you are as a person. Um, it's one of those things where you might think what you're doing is good enough, but if that idea is never challenged, you don't know how much better you could be. So this is just worth checking out to see if he has any suggestions that you might want to adopt to tweak your learning style and your active learning behaviors and habits to get a better grade, which I'm sure you all want. I also want to make you aware of Bloom's learning levels, and this is because we evaluate you, the outcome of which is grading, based on different levels of this. So what we're looking for if you want to earn an A, an A equals the student shows mastery. So mastery means you could teach the course. So if you know the material so well that you could potentially take over for me for a day, that shows mastery, then that would be earning an A or an A+. Anything less than that is from failing, so showed no mastery, to a C level, which is shows a level of knowledge acquisition that is average or about as good as the average student would do. So we evaluate you on Bloom's learning levels. So if you only did level one remembering, that would probably earn you a D to a C-ish. If you do this plus understanding, that's going to bump you up a little bit. And if you can do almost everything all the way to the top, so you show conceptual mastery, that's when you earn an A. So remembering is great. You need it. You need to learn new words and terms and remember what they mean. But if you can't make sense of and apply what you learn to a problem or place what you know in a contextual framework that relates what you know to other stuff that you know, then that doesn't show mastery. So this is kind of the basis of evaluation and you're going to want to have these in mind as you make your way through the class. Make sure that you do deep learning instead of superficial learning that's just remembering. Students find memorization to be very comforting, but it's not good enough by itself to get you that A. Okay, so that's all the boring stuff. Let's talk about actual biology. So biology is the study of life itself. So anytime there's one of these science words here, um, and these are made primarily of Latin and Greek roots. And I'm gonna go out on a limb here and guess that you guys probably aren't Latin scholars because it's functionally a dead language. And very few United States citizens speak Greek unless they are Greek themselves or come from a Greek family. So uh, these two languages are most of biological terminology. So functionally, learning biological terminology is 
similar to learning little bits of two different languages at once. So it's challenging. So fortunately, these kinds of words come with prefixes and suffixes, which have their own individual meaning, and then they adopt a new meaning when they get mashed together into a word. So bio means life, and logi, logos is, is knowledge or wisdom. Uh, so logi is the study of or gaining wisdom about. So biology is the study of life. Now, we will explore each of these in turn, and what these are, are answers to this question. So, what is life? And another way to say this is, what are the criteria uh, that an organism must meet in order to be considered alive? So, one of those is order, meaning not an amorphous blob. Sensitivity or response to stimuli. So an example of that is, if you prick me, do I not bleed to get Shakespearean about it? Or uh, if you poke me, I'm going to notice that I'm being poked. Reproduction is another criterion for life. So a thing has to be able to make more of itself in order to be considered living. There's different kinds of reproduction. We'll talk about that. Adaptation is the ability to tolerate change in environment and survive in spite of it. Growth and development are what they sound like, so organisms get bigger, and they change over time. So you all went from being babies to being adults, just as I did, and both of those things were happening as we were growing up. Regulation is metabolic housekeeping activities, so using fuel, passing waste, those kinds of things. Homeostasis is the outcome of regulation, so this is maintaining constant conditions in spite of changing external conditions. And all of this requires energy processing. So for us, we eat, and that means we are turning food molecules into energy to power our cells. So now we'll go through the, each of those properties step by step. So here we have a toad. So there's our toad. Um, this is a very pretty toad. It's got nice patterns. As you can see, along this axis, the toad is symmetrical. So the left side of the toad looks about like what the right side does, give or take injuries or deformities, but most toads are symmetrical. It also has a head, which is a functional area that is different from that of its butt or its leg. So a highly organized structure is inherent in this organism, and if you were to take a slice of this toad, don't advocate slicing toads, but imagine, you would see that it consists of cells, which are arranged into tissues, and those tissues are arranged into organs, and those organs are arranged into organ systems. So to give you an example of each, let's say we have a mucus cell. So mucus cells secrete mucus, and that helps to keep the toad uh, lubricated and its skin uh, slightly damp so that it can do respiration through its skin. So these mucus cells sit in the tissues of the integument, which is the skin. And the integumentary system is itself an organ. And organ systems are groups of organs that have a like function. So the integumentary system is part of the systems of the toad that process waste and that provide immune defense. So that's order for you. So one of the main challenges of this class is convincing your brain to think on different size scales than you might be used to. So think about your average activity as you go about your life as a person. You're thinking about things that are human-sized in general. So we think of the world through the scale at which we can understand it and interact with it. So I live in a space that is many times the size of my body because that's how I can be a comfortable human. I'm used to thinking about commuting in my city, which is a population of humans, um, 
but I'm not necessarily as used to thinking about the interstellar void that exists between different star systems. That's a, a unit of measurement that's really, really big, and it's hard for me to convince my brain to conceive of it. Same deal with atoms. So atoms make up all matter. You're touching atoms all the time, and you're made of them. But thinking about an individual atom and how small that is is tricky to convince my hominid brain to do. So I would encourage you to spend some time thinking about those things and just kind of try and prime your brain to start thinking on different scales than you might be used to. So let's dig into this a little bit. An atom is a basic unit of matter. So this is smallest down here, and this is biggest. So this is an example of, oopsie, this is an example of uh, one of the kinds of learning I might ask you to do. So remembering what an atom is is great, but that's just remembering. Applying would be if I gave you all of these terms mixed up and I asked you to put them in order from smallest to largest, that would be you showing me that not only do you know what an atom is, but you can place it in a contextual framework relative to other terms in its correct place. So atoms are the basic unit of matter and they contain subatomic particles, which you will learn about later. When two or more atoms get together and bond with each other in a particular way, we call that a molecule. And molecules make up the little structures inside of cells. So an organelle is like the cell's version of an organ. So each cell has a membrane that separates it from the outside and it has cell guts, using air quotes here, you can't see that though. Um, and those guts are organelles. So those are membrane enclosed structures that form uh, the little organs inside of a cell cells themselves. So in this case, we have human blood cells. So not all cells are created equal. Different cells have different jobs. These are blood cells. They carry oxygen around. There are other kinds of cells. When two or more cell types get together and perform cooperatively a particular function, then we call them a tissue. So this is human skin tissue. So you can see these pink cells here are different from these lighter pink cells down here, but they're all part of the skin. Two or more tissue types cooperating in a group makes up an organ. And two or more organs cooperating to perform some kind of function make up an organ system. Organisms is the sum total of all of the organ systems in one genetically distinct individual. And organisms live in populations. So a population is a group of like organisms. So you might talk about the human population in the Pacific Northwest, or to zoom it in even smaller, the rabbit population that is resident to Clark, Camp, Clark College. Uh, if you walk quietly at certain times of day on campus, there are bunnies around and they're very cute, so keep an eye out. But that would be an example of a population, all of the rabbits that live at Clark. And communities, which is groups of populations. So community might be all of the wildlife that occupies Clark campus. We've got birds, we've got bugs, we've got people, we've got bunnies. I'm sure we have rats because everywhere has rats. Sorry to break the bad news to you, but they're ubiquitous. So an ecosystem includes a community and the non-living or abiotic factors or environment in which they live. Oopsie. So abiotic, so this prefix a here means not, and bio means life, and this is just a suffix that denotes an adjective. So to, to call something abiotic means I'm telling you that it's not living. So these are biota, or biotic organisms, these are living. So biotic plus abiotic equals an ecosystem. And then the biosphere is the biggest system of all, so this is all of the ecosystems on Earth, period. Okay, properties of life two, sensitivity or response to stimuli. So a stimulus is any change in environmental conditions that an organism would respond to with a change of its own. So this plant is Mimosa pudica, and this is called the quote-unquote sensitive plant. So you'll see an animation of this in a minute. Basically, if you touch this plant, it recoils from your touch, which is not a behavior of plants that we're used to, but it's pretty nifty to see. 
and even the smallest organisms will respond to stimuli. So uh, there's lots of bacteria that will follow magnetic fields or follow a chemical trail, or if you shine light on them, they run away. Those are all responses to stimuli. So everything from very complex organisms like this sensitive plant to very simple organisms that only have one cell do this. So there is the plant curling up. I imagine it doesn't like that very much, so I'm going to add a caption there. Okay, reproduction, growth, and development. So reproduction is the act of making more of oneself, and that comes in different versions. So asexual reproduction is cloning. So I want to stress here that cloning on a human or large organism level uh, is a scientific procedure that is performed, but there are lots of smaller, less complex organisms that reproduce naturally by cloning. So um, cloning has been in the news because of controversy over, you know, should we clone organisms? If we should, when should we do it? Should we clone people? Why are we not? But if you are a tiny organism whose only option is to reproduce by cloning, then all you do is just make another one of you. And then you have two new individuals that are genetically identical. So it's pretty common in the natural world. Sexual reproduction comes when two parents recombine genes to make a unique individual that is not genetically identical to either of them, but features components of both of their genetics. So although none of these kittens look alike, these kittens have inherited genes from both parents and share many of the same characteristics. I'm going to put a caveat on that. So let's label these kittens. I'm going to call this one, two, three, and four. So cats carry litters, meaning that all of these kittens share the same womb. Womb mates, if you will. However, Cats can carry litters of multiple paternity. So uh, because it takes a distinct fertilization event, egg plus sperm, egg plus sperm, egg plus sperm, egg plus sperm, uh, for each kitten to be formed, if a female cat mates with more than one male cat, she can carry a litter of kittens uh, with multiple paternities involved. So it's not necessarily 100% true that these cats are all going to have the same dad. Uh, I think I feel like cat number four is pretty likely to have a different father from cats one through three. So just something to keep in mind because we're used to uh, single or potentially up to triple births with fairly regular occurrence in humans. We don't really carry litters, but in litter bearing animals, uh, multiple paternity is totally possible. So regardless of whether you are a complicated and beautiful little kitten, Personally, I like four the best. I'm going to give him a crown. King of kittens. Uh, or you're a tiny little itty bitty bacterium that reproduces by cloning. All organisms grow and develop. All right, so let's talk about adaptation, regulation, and homeostasis. So adaptation, let's talk about that first. This is natural selection. So um, Natural selection and evolution are considered to be fundamental truths about the natural world, and we're not going to debate that in class. Um, so that's how we're going to deal with that terminology in our classroom. So natural selection is the gradual change of species over long periods of time, and that's in response to the environment. So the idea behind this is there are reasons why life looks the way it does. So a good example of this is giraffes. So feeding behaviors in giraffes involve reaching upwards to get leaves. Shorter giraffes might not survive as well 
because by the time they get to a tree, maybe a taller giraffe has eaten all of the leaves up to and above what the shorter giraffe can reach. So there was positive selection over long, long periods of time for longer-necked giraffes to have better odds of surviving and reproducing. And because only the longer-necked giraffes were surviving and reproducing, uh, necks got longer over time. So that's kind of the idea behind that. So that would be an adaptation to changes in resource acquisition. Regulation is metabolic processes to coordinate internal functions. So this is a very generalized way of saying the sum total of all the chemical reactions that help keep you alive inside your cells. So a good example of that is delivering oxygen to cells. That's what your red blood cells do. Or eliminating waste. So your kidneys will help you process waste from your blood so that you urinate it out. Homeostasis means that you maintain relatively constant internal conditions despite changing external conditions. So an example of this is uh, human body temperature should always be at about 37 degrees Celsius, which is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, your body temperature will fluctuate over time. So here we have an axis. Let's call this, why does this do that? Time. And over time, so this is going to be a little bit warmer. This is going to be a little bit cooler. All right, sorry about that. There was a momentary interruption, but I'm back. So back to our analogy. So 37 degrees Celsius is what humans sit at temperature-wise due to our metabolic processes. So our metabolism produces heat, and that heat escapes us to create this body temperature. Now, over time, that 37 degrees C is going to fluctuate a little bit, so, for example, when you go to sleep, your body temperature drops and stays lower while you're asleep, and then it raises back up when you're awake. But if you were to average out all these data points along this line, the average would be about 37. And this is in spite of changes in environmental conditions. So let's say it's cold and I go outside. My body is not going to drop to the temperature of the outside it's going to stay at 37 degrees C. So that's an example of homeostasis, maintaining constant internal conditions even if external stuff changes. All right, and energy processing. So all living things, anything from something as complex as a condor, which is what this guy is, uh, to very simple things like bacteria, need energy. And we get energy by consuming other organisms or some organisms can make their own energy. Ultimately, all of the energy comes from the sun. So that sun is our life source for our planet. Uh, but after that, there are different sources of energy. So I can't just go outside and stand in the sun and charge up. That would be awesome, but I can't do it. So where does this energy come from? Let's examine the sources. So sunlight is the primary one. If you are an organism that can make food from sunlight, so for example, plants or anything that's photosynthetic, then you are called a primary producer and then other animals will feed on you. So uh, herbivores just eat plants. And so they use the energy that the plants created by turning sunlight and air into food and tissue. Food is anything that is consumed. So this includes plants plus non-plants. And some organisms are actually able to make energy out of chemicals. So these are generally called chemoautotrophs. So chemo means chemicals. Auto means self. And troph is a root that's related to feeding or nourishment. So a chemoautotroph is going to be an organism that nourishes itself using chemicals. So here we have a condor. This is a California condor. They are endangered. Uh, condors are carrion eaters. So they eat dead stuff. And for that reason, they're really helpful because dead things can carry disease vectors. That's why we have a taboo against touching dead stuff because that's where bacteria be and bacteria can be harmful. Um, but 
Condors and vultures and other birds that eat carrion are really good at consuming the flesh of dead animals that might otherwise contaminate or harm other organisms. So they're a really important part of uh, the ecosystem in which they live. And they use the chemical energy that they get from eating dead stuff to fly around. And these birds are really, really big. So I am five foot six. And last time I went to the zoo to visit the condors, uh, a condor standing on the ground with its wings folded comes up to about my chest. They're gigantic. So eating enough for them to get airborne takes a lot of energy, and they're going to have to eat a lot of carrion to achieve that. Okay, so let's talk about how life forms are classified. What does this mean? Well, obviously your cat is not the same as your dog. Neither of the two are the same as you, nor are any of you like an organism that is super complicated, like a, oh, uh, one of those praying mantises that looks like an orchid, for example. So life forms are obviously different. They come in a lot of different varieties, and we need a way to name them things. So Traditionally, we've used hierarchical taxonomy, which is a way to name things on the basis of how related they are to each other. So that's what hierarchical means. Uh, so this is traditional, and this is based on the morphology of the organism. So morphology, morph means shape, and ology is the study of. So morphology is the study of the shapes of things, and there are biological morphologists that study why animals are shaped the way they are. So uh, why do certain birds have a weird shaped beak? Why do certain animals have extra claws or appendages? Those kinds of things. So shapes. And so starting in about the mid 1700s, but still used today. Uh, so this actually should say Linnaeus. That's how you spell his name. His name is Carolus Linnaeus. Um, He's a Scandinavian scientist that decided that he was going to name things based on how similar they looked to each other, which makes sense, right? You know, so pigeons are a group of birds. There are different kinds of pigeons, but if you look at a pigeon or a dove, you're like, mm, it's a pigeon or a dove. So that's a clump of animals that are similar but not identical to each other. Uh, more recently, we've added phylogenetic trees to this hierarchical taxonomy. And that's because due to something called convergent evolution, sometimes two organisms look really, really similar, but genetically are super distant from each other. But it's only now that we have the ability to examine genes that we found this out. So um, we've used this since about the 1970s, and we look for evolutionary relationships uh, and genetic similarity or difference between organisms to help us uh, fix any mistakes that were generated by the hierarchical taxonomy. So we'll look at each of these in turn, but both taxonomy and phylogenetics start with the three domains of life. So domains are three overarching categories of living things um, that is sort of the starting point for sorting. So think about a really messy room full of really a lot of things, like a great diversity of stuff. If it's so messy that you're like, gosh, I'm not really sure where to start, most people would start by sorting stuff. So this is the laundry pile, and this is the recycling pile, and this is the garbage pile. That's the starting point, and that's the idea behind the domains. If you have an incredible amount of biotic diversity, where do you even start to sort? Well, start broad and then go narrow. So that's what we're going to do now. Okay, so the domains of life. We have three of them, bacteria which should be a familiar word to most of you. So we think of these as little single-celled organisms uh, often that make us sick. Archaea, which are even older, um, and these are typically extremophiles, meaning they favor extreme environments like uh, the sulfurous hot springs in Yellowstone, or they like to live in the ice in Antarctica. And eukarya, which includes animals and plants. So this is the domain that we're used to thinking about because we belong to it. These two, not as much. So let's define them, shall we? Bacteria are very small, always single-celled. So if it's got more than two cells, not a bacterium. Uh, these are very simple organisms. 
Archaea are similar to bacteria, so they're very small and they're single-celled, but they have very extreme adaptations, so they're able to survive high temps, extreme acid, no light, nasty chemicals. So that's the example of what archaea are able to achieve. Eukaryotes, or eukarya, these are more complex cells. They are larger and they include all multicellular organisms. So let me just erase this so you can read. So if it's got more than one cell, it is in the domain eukarya. And this includes organisms that are very simple, like nematode worms all the way to organisms that are very complex, like lions. Okay, so we've just covered domain, which is the broadest category, and I said now we're going to start to get narrower. So you're going to narrow stuff down. So hierarchical taxonomy, uh, oops, now you guys can see what I'm listening to on my headphones. Uh, I actually, if anybody wants uh, chill wordless study music for concentration let me know uh i'm a master of that as a result of having gone to college grad school and having to listen to music while grading things so if you need uh, tips for that hit me up okay so we just talked about the domain and here we have a fox a red fox which is vulpes vulpes and i'll talk about this binomial nomenclature or two name system in a minute so the way we name things is by taking broad categories and then dividing those categories up into uh, smaller and slightly more specific subgroups until you get to an individual kind of thing. So after domain, the order goes kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And the reason I can say that so fast is because I have memorized it, and you will too. So this is just the order of increasing specificity as we get to the species name itself. So higher categories will include more species and organisms than lower ones. And organisms in the same category lower down will be more closely related. So let's apply this principle to our fox here. So the kingdom's animalia, which is all animals, so ergo not plants. The phylum is chordata, so these are things with the backbone. Not all animals have spines. The class is mammalia, so these are organisms with mammary glands. So they lactate to feed their young. The order here is carnivora, and carnivora are meat eaters, so I'm going to make my arrow pass through my fox here. Eat. Meat. So they hunt and kill prey. The family is Canidae, which you guys are probably familiar with. This is dogs and dog-like creatures. The genus is Vulpes. So these are all of the foxes. There are different kinds of foxes, right? We have red fox, arctic fox, for example, um, desert sand fox, fennec fox. So these are all different kinds of foxes, but they're in the genus Vulpes. And then the species name has two parts, Vulpes, Vulpes. Now they don't always repeat. Um, but the common way to say the scientific name of a creature is by saying its genus and then its specific species name, which is the second one. So Vulpes, Vulpes is the red fox. So whoever named that one decided that since it seems like it's the ar archetypal fox, we're just going to call it the fox fox and be done with it. Come on there. There we go. Okay, so here's an example of a phylogenetic tree of life. So we just showed you a fox. So here we have this line represents some common ancestor. So likely the first cell. And then after that, we get all these splits. So this is called a phylogenetic tree. And it was made by a microbiologist named Carl Woese using genetic relationships. So these are 
not imaginary or based on shape. This is actually quantifiable, which means able to be sorted out mathematically. Quantifiable genetic data taken from a bunch of organisms. So the closer the organism's branches are, the more similarly, or similar they are genetically and probably evolutionarily. So here's us animals over here in Archaea. So for us, our genus is Homo, which means like, and our species is sapiens. Uh, to be sapient means that you are intelligent. So Homo sapiens is like intelligent. Um, there used to be other Homo genus uh, species that were similar but not identical to us. So uh, if you go back and look at human evolutionary history, there's Homo erectus, which are named because they were thought to be the first upright standing uh, members of our genus, and Homo habilis. Uh, none of these species exist anymore. They are extinct. We are the only remainder. But you can see that over here in Eukarya, um, there are a bunch of kinds of animals that are more distantly related to us, even though they fall within our domain. Uh, and there are animals, or uh, species that are, not animal species rather, that are very closely related to us, but not identical. So actually we are very closely related to fungi. Um, and even pretty closely related to slime molds and plants. Okay, so you're here to learn biology, but biology is gigantic. So uh, for example, so here we have a, another hierarchy. So we have, we're starting very small with the atom, smallest, and then large. So here we have a hydrogen atom, and a hydrogen atom makes up one part of a water molecule. Water molecules are abundant inside of cells, um, so there's water in the organelle, the nucleus. A nucleus is an organelle uh, made of molecules that lives inside of a cell, in this case a neuron. And neurons, along with other neurons, make up nervous tissue. And those are wrinkled up into a shape that we call the brain, which is an organ. And the organ system is the nervous system. So this includes the brain and the spinal cord and all of the nerves. The organism is a sea lion. We have these uh, off the Oregon coast. You can go see them if you like. And then all of the sea lions that live together and interbreed with each other are a population, which we call a sea lion colony. So in Oregon, you can go see sea lion caves. And I said here in Oregon because I live in Portland, so that's uh, slight bias in my presenting, I apologize, but I'm more familiar with sea lion colonies in Oregon, so there you go. Um, the community that they belong to is a kelp forest. The ecosystem is wherever it is, so this example gives you the southern California coast, but there are sea lions all up and down the coast, and those are part of the biosphere. So if you're an ecologist, you study kind of this sector. That's just one example. Let's say you're a evolutionary biologist. You might study how related or not related different species of sea lions are to each other. So how close are stellar sea lions to California sea lions? If you're a physiologist, you're gonna study how these work. If you're a cell biologist in particular, you're gonna study the behavior of a particular cell. If you are a molecular biologist, you're gonna study the molecules that support life, primarily genetic ones. And if you're a biochemist, you're going to be concerned with how these influence living organisms. And I don't mean hydrogen and water specifically, although they're candidates, I mean any chemical reaction that supports life. So you can work at any level of organization that you like, 
Um, a lot of you are probably here because you want to work at the healthcare level, so the biology of humans specifically, but you need to have a broad sense of biology in order to place uh, human anatomy and physiology in the appropriate context. So we're going to um, cover a lot of stuff here. So me, in particular, uh, I am a, this is a long science word, bear with me, behavioral neuro endocrinologist by training. So that's what my uh, graduate research was in. Basically, that's a long science word that means the corner of biology that I chose to study was how the nervous system and hormones how those two things affect animals behavior so why do animals do the things they do and what processes physiologically make them do that so why do cats go into heat why do birds choose to migrate at particular times of year uh, why do frogs call and breed seasonally? All of those things are something that a behavioral neuroendocrinologist can investigate. So that's me, but there's a lot of other stuff that you can do as well. So it's a big field, which means that there's lots of opportunity. So there's molecular. Uh, oh, forensic biology is also another offshoot of molecular. So if you examine uh, trace molecular evidence from crime scenes, that's one option. These ones relate to medical science. Paleontology allows you to study organ systems ancestrally. Epidemiology studies how disease moves through colonies. I already covered ecology. So. Not only are there lots of different disciplines uh, within the discipline of biology, but they all relate to each other a lot. So biomedical science and health and social issues are related. So if we want to create a society where people are maximally healthy and happy, the healthy component matters. So biomedical science is concerned with how do we keep people healthy and the health and social issues links good health to good living. So people are happier and less likely to harm society if they're healthy. So how can we make those two things happen? Um, or environmental science and technology. So let's say that you are trying to solve a problem. For example, the accumulation of microplastics in the ocean. Maybe if you're a material scientist, you know about this problem and you develop uh, by engineering available materials a plastic magnet that can go mop up plastic from the ocean. So that's an example of a link there. And there's many, many others that I could give examples of, but I just want to point out that just because you focus on one particular area of biology, say biomedical science, maybe you want to be a doctor, doesn't mean that you can't interact with other scientific disciplines in a way that's meaningful and fulfilling to you. So you don't necessarily have to pigeonhole yourself into one thing. Some fields of science include a bunch of other fields as well. So astronomy, biology, computer science, geology, logic, physics, chemistry, and mathematics. So all of these are interconnected. For example, chemists study matter, which is anything made of atoms, and the behavior of subatomic particles to a limited extent. That's more for physics. Um, the behavior of subatomic particles is a primary concern of physicists, but of course, subatomic particles are part of atoms, which chemists study. All of that stuff is what makes up our cosmos, so that's astronomy for sure, and being an astronomer involves a lot of physics as well. So those are just some examples of how those things are interconnected. So science is basically just knowledge about the natural world. So we live in a world that we didn't choose to create and we manipulate objects within it to suit our survival and liking but part of being a human is wanting to know why about things so we're naturally curious organisms um, and so that's how science developed is people wanted to know more about the natural world so imagine you're a primitive human and you notice that sometimes the sky yells at you and it gets really flashy it affects your life, so you probably want to know why the sky is yelling and getting flashy. Um, 
So you either invent some mythology to explain it, like, oh, this guy is mad at us because we didn't do an appropriate dance. Or later, you might undertake uh, meteorology and make sense of the sky being angry and throwing water at you and shouting uh, based on pressure systems of air that are moving through your, your area. So this just helps us make sense of the world we live in. So how do we do science? Science is obviously very diverse, but the way that scientists perform scientific inquiry is called the scientific method. And this is a way that we can work through step by step um, from a question to an idea about why the question might be to the answer to the question or what we think is the answer to the question at, to the best of our ability. So this is called the scientific method and it's really important. So various categories of science. Natural sciences deal with any aspect of our natural physical world, so biology, astronomy, geology, chemistry, etc. Um, we kind of divide these up into life sciences, so separating biotic stuff from abiotic stuff. There's the social sciences, which are the sciences that are concerned with uh, human interactions, so uh, ways that human cultures differ, differ from each other, why humans behave towards each other the way they do, um, the behaviors involved with our actions and trading. There's the formal sciences, which is science that applies to principles that don't care about us at all. So math is math because it's math. Math isn't the way it is because it suits some human purpose. Math is the way it is because that's the way it is. Um, and there's also applied science. And these ones are useful because they take knowledge about the social, formal, and natural sciences and use it to solve specific problems. So uh, for example, engineering, let's use a really simple example. You want to go to the village across the river, but the river is wide and it's deep. And it takes a lot of calories to row your boat across the river every time. What if you could just walk across? Wouldn't that be handy? Well, if you want to build a thing across the river that's going to stay put for many generations and not fall into the river and kill you, you have to design that structure in a particular way. That's what engineering is. So again, there's a lot of overlap between these fields, and I encourage you as you make your way towards your career to just be open-minded and consider that perhaps your interest will change and maybe you want to go down a different direction than you previously thought. That's fine. You can still be a scientist uh, regardless of what you choose to focus on. Okay, basic versus applied science. So basic science is really important, and that's how we've formed the bulk of knowledge about the way the world works. Um, pursuit of no new knowledge regardless of if there is any immediate or short-term use for it. So not science that's designed to solve a problem, but rather science just because somebody wanted to know. Um, so what is the average lifespan of the Culex species of mosquito? Here we have a jerk. I don't like mosquitoes. I'm allergic to their bites. They bother me, but they have just as much of a right to exist as any other organism. Um, so what the average lifespan of them is? Well, maybe someone just wanted to know that because they got bit by mosquitoes a bunch of times and were like, golly, I wonder how long those things live. Applied science are experiments that are based on the need to know specific information for some immediate application. So one reason you might want to know the lifespan of this mosquito is to perform some epidemiology. So if we know that mosquitoes are disease vectors, which means they carry diseases, specifically the West Nile virus, um, you might wanna know how much longer or shorter disease carrying mosquitoes last compared with non-disease carrying mosquitoes. And that would give you a little bit of extra knowledge to try and solve the problem of the spread of a known pathogen. Okay. So let's talk about the scientific method. I said that there is a series of defined steps and that's true. That's actually implicit in the definition. So these include experiments and careful observation. So careful observation, sorry, I had to pause for a second because I was going to cough and I didn't want to cough in the microphone. 
turns out talking for this long dries your throat out significantly. So basically, you form a question based on an observation. So let's think of an example. Uh, I observed that in certain areas, if I splash the seawater at night, it glows. Neat. So an obvious question I might ask is, why is this seawater special and glowy compared to other seawater? And then I could form a hypothesis that answers the question. So let's say for this, uh, my hypothesis is that it's not the water molecules themselves that are glowing, but rather something in water is glowy. And then I might make a prediction based on the hypothesis. So I could predict that if it's something in the water that's glowy, then if I distill the water and take all of the stuff out of it that's not water, distilled water won't be glowy. So distilled water we call DI water. Not glowy because nothing is in there to make it glow. It's only water molecules. So to test this, I could gather some of the glowy seawater and part of that seawater I could distill and the rest of the seawater I would leave alone. And then I would hit them and compare and see which one glowed and which one didn't. So if distilling the water took away its glowiness, that would mean my hypothesis was supported. So that would suggest that indeed something in the water between the water molecules is the thing that's doing the glowing. If I distilled the water and it still glowed, then my hypothesis would not be supported. So I'd go back to the drawing board and say, okay, well, I wasn't right the first time, but who cares about that? I'm going to form another hypothesis and try it again. If my hypothesis is supported or if it's not, we still report the results. So communication is a really important piece of science as well as doing experiments in the order I just described. Um, this is actually the topic of lab one, and this is gonna help you understand how scientists do the stuff that they do. So it's not nutty professor style with all kinds of crazy bubbling beakers and vials in the sort of disorganized lab, although speaking from personal experience, some labs do look like that. Um, but even if the lab looks messy or disordered, all scientists, all good scientists, follow this particular hierarchy of steps. So a hypothesis is a tentative explanation. So tentative means not set in stone, not definitely right, but maybe. It's an educated guess. But it has to be testable. So I can hypothesize that there is a giant manta ray made of dark matter above which the cosmos is floating. And that might explain gravitational waves because it flaps its little flappies. There is no way to test this. I cannot prove or disprove the existence of giant dark matter manta ray. Uh, it's just an idea about way the cosmos might work. So that's not a good hypothesis because it's not testable. So a good framework for this is if then because. So let's apply this to my water example. If water in some areas glows when struck or disturbed, then something in the water must be doing the glowing because other water doesn't glow. So a valid hypothesis must be falsifiable, meaning there is a way to test that hypothesis and to support or not support it. So hypothesis does not equal a prediction. You can make a prediction about your hypothesis, but that has limited utility. And a hypothesis is also not a theory. A theory are, is, is way more powerful. So the theory of evolution by natural selection is one example of a theory. Or let's, what's another one? Let's see. Um, immune theory, which is ideas about the way that the cells of our body behave in the presence of other cells, or the theory of gravity, which is testable and falsifiable. I bet if you drop something, it goes down, right? So theories are gathered from many, many hypotheses that have either been supported or not supported. Okay. So before we end, let's make a final note. And we need to distinguish between inductive and deductive reasoning. Um, 
so this is something that Sherlock Holmes, if you watch the show with Benedict Cumberbatch, or if you're even old school and just go read the Arthur Conan Doyle books, they're great and also public domain, so you can get them for free. Recommend them. Uh, you'll notice that these two words are occasionally used in those mystery books. So first step is to make an observation. So look at a thing and the way it behaves. Ask a question, such as, why it do what it do. Form a hypothesis. So remember, if, then, because. And then you conduct an experiment and either accept your hypothesis as probably correct or reject it as definitely not correct. And then you go back to this step. So inductive reasoning is descriptive science. And this involves observing, exploring, or discovering. So an example of inductive reasoning would be, I decide to go to an island that no one has ever gone to before. And when I'm there, I find a bug. And when I take that bug back to the mainland, I find out that this bug has never been seen before. So I just discovered a new bug. Cool. Now we know a new bug exists, not because I had tested the hypothesis that unknown bugs may exist, but because I randomly stumbled upon one. Deductive reasoning is hypothesis-based science. So there's a specific question and you arrive at one of many possible answers. So inductive occupies this level of the hierarchy. Excuse me. Deductive is this process. So most modern science is deductive reasoning and it is performative in that the way it's done is that we do these steps until we feel confident about our results and then we report them. And that is the end of our slideshow. So thank you for your attention and I hope you find these screencasts useful. Uh, keep checking back on the YouTube page for updates as we move along throughout the term. Adiós.